Attention all listeners, this podcast is now sponsored by the author of XI, a collection of poetry on being human, written by Andrew Joseph Zaragoza Jr. Release date is going to be August 15th. Pre-order is available now. More information located on the bio. Thank you, and looking forward to hearing from you soon. Now on with the podcast. I watched that image. Shoot the shit, the relaunch, man. I'm I'm excited, man. We're bringing back shoot the shit. It's been a cool minute. It's gonna be. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. I've been wanting to do shoot the shit for a while now. Um, we got some new people joining us on shoot the shit. Of course, we got Will Martinez here, um, and we got Logan, who uh, is not with us today, but will be on future episodes, uh, as well as Sammy. Um, so, yeah, shoot the shit. Uh, the podcast that when I when I really sh- when I really thought of this podcast, it was something that we could take a group of friends and just sit around and talk uh, um, about anything. Uh, as you as you guys know, our channel really focuses mainly on horror, and uh, it, it's good to take a break from that every now and then and, and just get what's off our chest as far as uh, things that are happening in the world, whether it be um, openings of something, uh, movies coming out. Uh, sporting events. I don't know. Who knows? Everything. It could be anything. Everything and everything. So this is why literally we do shoot the shit so we can shoot the shit about these topics. Um, joining me today, of course, is Will, the newest member of the Knights of Horror. You guys met him. You guys seen him. You guys should know him by now. Um, and uh, oh. what's up? I said, and if you don't know me by now, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then you're gonna be getting a visit. Um, but no, I mean, it's not going to just be me all the time. It will be all of us. Sometimes it could be three of us, maybe just two of us, but, uh, rest assured you, you, you will see at least two of us every time when we record this. So, uh, Logan couldn't be here tonight. He, uh, was doing, I think he had other plans that he had made and Sammy is still sick. So he's still recovering from that. So, um, I, I, I project conversations we've had sammy may be returning um next week on the channel so that's good um for all you fans of sammy out there he, he's returning he's making his return soon so he's missed all of you guys trust me and he's missed will and he's missed logan we missed him yeah um but today on shoot the shit i mean we're just gonna talk about stuff that's going on in the world right now man i mean there, there's a lot of buzz in the theme park world uh, there's rumors of events potentially closing or turning into full-on daytime operations. Uh, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting world we live in. There's a couple things I want to talk about too, as far as reunions go, because we've been seeing a lot of those lately uh, via Zoom. Uh, one of my favorite things that happened in the recent, um, like last week or two, was uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World reunion. That was cool. I don't know if you've seen that. Have you seen that yet? I've not. No, dude. So that movie, if you guys don't know, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, one of my all-time favorite movies. Um, it came up. I want to say it came out ten years ago. Yeah, because it was a ten-year anniversary. They all got together, did a table read of the entire movie. It is on YouTube right now. You can watch it. I was fanboying out so hard over that. That's awesome. Yeah, I I don't know, man. I, I there's something about Scott Pilgrim vs. the World to me that was just when that movie came out, it was so freaking beautiful, and that goes with anything Edgar Wright does. I love Edgar Wright, one of my favorite filmmakers of all time. Uh, responsible for Shaun of the Dead, he's responsible for Hot Fuzz, The World's End, anything that you see with pretty much Simon Pegg and Nick Frost in it, he probably helped do it, which I which I love. Um. So when he did Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, uh, I was in love with this movie. I mean, I love the the graphic novels that were done, very good graphic novels. I love the um, the characters in the story, and they cast this perfectly. Like, even in the reunion, Chris Evans even came, did his lines, and then he had a dip after. But he, the fact that he was still there, I was right. like, you got Captain America there now, dude. Come on. But yeah, man, have you ever seen Scott Pilgrim vs. the World? I've seen parts of it. I just didn't know if they had their reunion. That's what came out. Yeah, but. it happened this week, or as of this recording, it happened this week. It happened on, um, let's say, Wednesday. So it happened on Monday. 
they had the video up and they, and what was really cool is they were they were doing a, a charity um, um, live stream where I guess they were um, it was uh, it was something with involving water I guess other countries in the world don't um, have like clean water available to them so all the funds raised for that live stream because uh, they were also having an auction the guy who wrote and uh, illustrated the book was on the the stream as well and as they were table reading the entire script he was actually drawing out a lot of the scenes from the movie like characters and stuff so yeah he was auctioning off those for charity which i thought was really awesome and a lot of those um drawings are dope i don't know if you've seen the art for this this book but it's beautiful no i haven't yeah it's uh scott pilgrim versus the world that i mean I, i bought the entire set um the box set. It's six books uh, at uh, Things from Another World at Universal Studios uh, City Walk. Uh, one of my favorite comic book stores, by the way. Um, shameless plug right there to Things from Another World. Sponsor us, please. Thank you. Sponsor shoot the shit. Um, but yeah, I, I, I absolutely love Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, and to see that reunion was really cool, man. Ten years. I can't believe that movie's ten years old, man. It doesn't even look like it's aged a day. Right? It looks great. It really does. Yeah. Are there uh reunions over like, zoom and whatnot that have happened recently um well if you keep up with josh gad he started this podcast called reunited apart um and he's been getting a lot of buzz from it lately because he brought back the cast from back to the future he brought back the cast from the goonies he brought back the cast from lord of the rings um he's brought back a lot of big time cast uh to reunite and, and reminisce on the past for those movies um so those have been cool to watch my favorite obviously was the back to the future one and the goonies one um all those kids have grown up you know marty and and doc are you know they're all they're much older now um two movies that have a lot of uh history that are iconic um it's always weird to see josh brolin in that movie because then you find out like (laughs) so many years later he plays thanos and it's like it's different Right, right, right. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I really like that. And there's a show that they did that I used to watch. It was called Chuck. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this show, but this guy basically gets this, like, computer in his head, and he becomes, like, a, like an asset for the for the FBI and all that and the CIA and ends up, like, seeing stuff in his brain uh, that help to the future of, of things. So, um, yeah, man, it's it is definitely... Uh, been a roller coaster of reunions, to say the least. <laughs> but. Um, in other news, uh, let's talk about some theme parks reopening and whatnot. With uh, right. Um, let's see. So we've got so far, uh, Knotts over here in SoCal. Right. Uh, and over on the East Coast, we have Disney World, uh, Universal Orlando, and there's probably others, but those are the ones that I. Uh, know most about but uh first let's talk about knots uh what is it taste of calico taste of calico man it's supposed to be kind of looking like looking like it's making up for its boysenberry festival that got canceled right when COVID hit right um i personally really love the tactic that uh knots used to start to like start bringing people back into the park right because i've definitely been effective in eliminating a lot of like the high touch and potentially high like danger zones which come with theme park rides and people are always touching handlebars and whatnot um so instead of tackling those major problems like how to sanitize all your vehicles and whatnot let's just like corral them into ghost town where it's a bit easier to section everything off but i think those are really creative way they did that as opposed to um like uh disney world and uh universal orlando right which uh i think they've been doing a pretty solid job over there too with keeping everybody distanced and whatnot um but it's just been interesting to see how these uh companies are choosing to go about letting everybody back into their parks and it uh and like adjusting to like the state's regulations and whatnot yeah i think the only thing that sucks about orlando right now is the fact that numbers keep spiking on a daily there um oh. which which really scares me because i really want to check out hhn 30 this year so bad and the fact that the event is happening because they've been advertising it like crazy, but my biggest fear is I'm gonna get I'm gonna go out there and I don't want to take the chance of catching COVID. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. 
like um, as much as I really want to go to this event, like I don't want COVID. <laughs> definitely interesting to see how like you know universal orlando kind of opened and they're just like business as usual obviously they have their safety measures set up. um but what i noticed is different between those two is walt disney world kind of um at least from what i i i'm not obviously the most uh knowledgeable on this but from what i can tell um disney almost like doesn't want you there they but they need a way like to pay for their like cast members and whatnot and like keep their system going um but uh so they've been just kind of keeping their parks open but with minimal like uh enticements for people to come and whatnot and i think it's definitely interesting uh and the different attitudes that these uh companies are taking towards the reopening right Uh, especially because oh the cases in florida (laughs) yeah man it's like Every weekend I'm seeing like 12,000 new cases on Sunday. I'm like, Jesus. Yeah, it's really mind-blowing to me that they were even able to open in the first place. Right. Um, I don't think the governor cares anymore, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really interesting seeing uh, how different states are handling this due to the total lack of um, federal control on this issue. But, um, uh, but yeah, it's definitely – uh, interesting to see how this plays out and how the companies are going to start. Whether or not this is going to make like long term changes once we've got like the vaccine out and like, right. got longer control, uh, it's going to be interesting to see if there's going to be lasting like cultural impacts for the theme park industry and how that plays out. So I think there's a multitude of situations that can happen there. Right. No, I mean I, I, we've seen it on the on the East Coast too. Our, our friends over at. Um... SoCal Exploring and Lost TV have been keeping us updated with what's been going on in Orlando at, at Universal Studios. It uh, looks like Lost is trying his best to kind of make weekly trips there to keep everybody updated as to what's going on. And it seems like the parks, to me, have been very empty. Um, and I have a feeling that's because maybe a lot of people are still scared to kind of go out and, and do that, especially with the rising cases uh, of the, the virus over there. But, I mean, if you're a theme park goer, like... I hate to say it, but I guess right now would be the best time to go because there's no crowds. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it's a good time to check out stuff, but like, I would, of course, be safe and 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 you know, it's, it's completely up to you. Um, I don't have time to go, but um, definitely shorter waits, I guess. <laughs> yeah, like way shorter waits, dude. Like, I I think I was watching um Adam the Woo, another big YouTuber out there. Um, has been in Orlando this last month um, doing the reopening of Walt Disney World. Um, And if you guys don't know, Walt Disney World has been opening their parks in phases. So, like, the first phase was, like, I think Animal Kingdom and um, the Magic Kingdom. And then it was uh, Epcot and Hollywood Studios. So he's been there for everything. And um, it's interesting to see how they're doing lines and stuff because they'll purposely put, like, a line's two and a half hours. But when he waits in it, it's actually 30 minutes because the fact of the social distancing makes it look that long because, you know, you have to have six feet apart. The lines are only so long, those queues. So it, it's really interesting to see all this work out. Now, there is, um, from what I've seen, some cases where um, I guess uh, sometimes you'll get your, like Adam, for example, he went on a ride and he got like the entire cart to himself. So I guess they're really looks like Disney World is kind of going by based around your the party that you're with and you kind of get your own car from there. I, I don't know. I mean, from Adam, he got on test track. He was just one person and he had the entire car to himself. So it, it's really interesting to see how they're, they're social distancing, distancing and, and keeping everything sanitized and stuff. And if you guys haven't seen, there was a video that actually surfaced around where I think it was uh, either Small World or Pirates of the Caribbean, I forget, but after they got off, they had guys with, like, these pumps just spraying down the seats to disinfect oh, wow. them. Yeah. That's intense. Yeah. That's good. And I like that tactic with the, like, bumping the wait times, like, so, like, to deter people from standing in these spots for longer than necessary. Right. Uh, I think that's a really smart thing for a lot of these uh, theme parks to do because it's, like, uh, they've got to be open because they have so many people they need to like pay and keep working. But at the same time, it's like, please don't go to these theme parks right now. Like for right. your safe, safety of cast members, it's just going to be so much better for everybody. If you stay home, and if you can't like, 
uh, these rules are trying everything, you know, they're pretty much trying everything they can to like uh, keep everybody safe. But, you know, there's only so much you can do with, um, uh, with such like a inherently high volume of people. Like the, these spaces are designed for such a high volume of people and like, um, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's definitely tricky, I guess, um, but. No, I, yeah. I agree. Um, and that's another thing I want to talk about. Did you see how crazy it was during the opening of Downtown Disney? I did. With all the people, like, uh, scalpers and stuff like that for eBay. And stuff. Oh, it was nuts, dude. Like, and that's, like, seeing that, I was like, do you guys really need to go to Disney World, Disney Downtown Disney on the opening day? Seriously. Like, you guys missed it that much. You had to go opening day. It's, like, it's never going anywhere. Right. And it's Downtown Disney, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, it's, nothing, it's nothing big. Like, they don't got that many good stores there. They have, like, two good stores, at least for me. I mean, I like the uh, – the Lego store, obviously, because they have some cool stuff in there, and I'm a fan of Legos and the World of Disney store, but they rarely have good shit in there. You know, like, I think they've got some pretty solid, like, restaurants and stores, and I love being there. Yeah. It's just, like, a spot to be, but, like, I don't know. It just seems kind of, uh, like, inappropriate for a lot of these people just to, like, uh, you know, just kind of they, like, lost all sense of, like, I don't know, like, order and whatnot, and disregard for the rules and i mean given the county that downtown disney's in i'm not entirely surprised but it definitely sucks because it's like seeing this open it's like uh we see how crowds are gonna are, are reacting to just even the smallest bit of like entry back into the park and it's like who knows how much longer it's gonna take because of that to get the rest of it fully operational and whatnot so All right yeah, it's it's definitely something. I mean, this like I said, this virus just kind of hit us overnight, and we're still learning about it every day. We really are. There, you know, there's not no cure for it really. There never there's never a cure for a virus. There's only a vaccine that your that your body can take to kind of uh, build an immune system to the virus. Pretty much, what a vaccine really does is it kind of just injects you with the virus to kind of build this immune system around it to fight it off. Um, right. That's why a lot of the times when you take a, a flu shot or something, that's because you get sick most of the time, and that's because your body is accepting the the virus so it can build an immune system around it. Right. But I don't know, man. With with downtown Disney, it was insane because <sighs> there was like people walking out with like thirty bags at that World of Disney store because everyone's hoarding the Splash Mountain merch because of its closing, and everybody's ho- hoarding the sixty five anniversary merch. Right, and I don't know if you've seen like eBay prices on like the Brer Bear and like and stuff like that. Especially just are crazy right now. They're in like the few hundreds. Right. Just I don't know. It just seems so silly and so trivial, <laughs> you right. know. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, I get it. There's a, it, that that ride has a huge fan base. That you know that ride's been there for years. It was one of my favorite rides. Um, you know, you can't get that song stuck out of your head. You know what I mean? It's it's a catchy song, um, but you know, and I will be honest. When I found out they were going to change it to Princess and the Frog, I I think I was a little upset more on the fact that I just had so many memories on that ride. But you know, I mean, I I think it, um, looking at it more now in a realistic standpoint, I think it's a very good move on Disney. Um, and you know, I think that ride is just like a lot of the rides when they when they retheme them, it's just outdated. It need a re- it needs a retheme. Right on top of all the problematic pieces of uh splash mountain it's just like it really was in need of either like a total rehaul or a retheme yeah uh i mean already those animatronics were not new to the ride because you know they came from the america sings attraction before they were put into uh splash mountain and so those have got a long history on them and uh you know ride's great the ride is a classic but i just think you know, we have room for another classic to be made right. uh, with Princess and the Frog. It could, be, really it could put some relevance in that area, too. It looks like that area, like, never gets any love. Right. It really doesn't. And you know what? I think there's a lot of theming potential because of uh, because Critter Country is right next to New Orleans Square. Um, and Walt Disney's original concept was to have a French Quarter section and a Bayou section. I think it makes a lot of sense to, like, expand New Orleans Square and, like, take over Critter Country because... 
it's not getting a whole lot of love as is, you know. So what does that mean for possibly the potential of Winnie the Pooh? Does that mean that they'll close that down and retheme that? It's hard to say because um I mean, we know Disney's not the most. I mean, you know, they're pretty sentimental about their rides, but I don't think Winnie the Pooh's got the biggest um you know, cult following behind it. I love Winnie the Pooh. It's been one of those rides that I've been on countless times since I was, you know, a small baby. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I think it's probably, I, I mean, like, look, uh, Winnie the Pooh replaced uh, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride in Florida. Like that <laughs> didn't show a ton of regard for um, for uh, Mr. Toad's when it was a really popular attraction. So I don't know if uh, Winnie the Pooh is going to be very safe after this routine. I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. It's right. Changing. It's got to keep evolving. Right. I, I, I will say this, though. There is some staple attractions that I don't think will ever leave. Um, oh. Haunted Mansion being one of them because that ride has such a big following that if they were to, like, remove it, I think fans would be pissed. Oh, yeah. Undoubtedly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's also one of the greatest dark rides ever created. Right. It's like the Pirates. That's that. That's kind of it. I mean, do you have any other ones that like come to mind? Like one of my favorite rides, and that's because my mom would always take me on it when I was a kid. Was uh, Alice in Wonderland, um, and even after they redone it, I think they redone it and made it even better. I don't know if you've been on it before it was redone, and then now what it looks like now, um, it's just beautiful. It looks like <laughs> here's your VHS and here's the fucking 4K update. Right, right, right. Of course. So. Uh- and they've done a they've done a really solid job with all of their like touch ups for those dark. Cause that gets dangerous, you know, because those are really simple rides. You don't want to like overdo them or anything. But it's like that, and they did a really amazing job on Peter Pan. Also, yeah. they did the touch ups for the project. Snow White's next, actually, because that's being worked on right now. Oh, is it? Yeah. There's any construction going on? That's exciting. They're retheming that- the entire ride. I think because it was too scary for kids, um, which I don't blame them. <laughs> I don't. No, yeah, me too. That that scarred me. That scarred me when I was like six. Yeah, that fucking that little witch is just evil and scary looking. Funny the this version of the attraction in comparison to like the original form of it is just like it's like nothing in comparison. Like I was watching through old like crappy like ride uh, ride throughs of the ride uh, from decades past, and it's just. It is terrifying. <laughs> like, my God. Yeah. Dude, let's talk about Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, though, man. Let, let's talk about the fact that you go to hell in that ride. Right. That's cool. I really enjoy that because it's, like, not something you really expect from a Disney ride. It's Yeah, not only a Disney ride but a kid's ride. And what's ironic enough is neither the book or the movie have a scene where he goes to hell. Right. It's really interesting, the creative liberty, and they chose that yeah. to go. And you know what? They did it beautifully, too. I I love all of those Fantasyland dark rides because they're, like, so simple, but they're just gorgeous. And they're, like, amazing pieces of theming and storytelling. That right. Just, you know, unparalleled pretty Wait, much. And it's funny because, like, every time you want to get on Peter Pan, it's like an hour wait. And you're like, I'm not waiting that long for that. <laughs> Uh, I do it. I do it all. That's my favorite ride in the whole park. It, whole it's park. it's a very solid ride, but I'm either getting on it the first thing in the morning or I'm waiting until after the fireworks show and waiting in that line just so I can get the first ride. A lot of times I've been like, 11.58, Peter Pan time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's uh, No, I, I think Fantasyland – it is uh it's really under a lot of like construction as far as it's it's starting to change a lot um and it started with of course uh like Alice in Wonderland got that major retheming which looked beautiful then Peter Pan got the retheming which looks wonderful with the new effects um Snow White's currently getting a whole new retheme of the entire ride to make it a more kid friendly ride um as well as the carousel, I think, was getting repainted. And not to mention, they redid all the Dumbo area to make it a bigger line queue and it looked a lot better. Yeah, it looks really good, especially from what it was before. But, oh my god, if Disney puts screens in Snow White, <laughs> I'm going to throw a riot. I think if you do the right mix of screens with animatronics like you did with Alice in Wonderland's retheme, it could work. Right. 
Uh, but part of me is also like, I mean, part of the like magic of those is like the simplicity of all of it. Like most of it's just like wood cutouts, you know, stuff, but it's still amazing. Right. I think screens have the potential to kind of mess with that a little. I'm just really hoping they keep it like. So I tell you, you haven't been on Rise of the Resistance yet then. No, I haven't. I, you know, I, uh, we didn't like renew our AP for the first time in like forever, like right when Star Wars Land opened for right. some reason. And I just never, I mean, those lines also, like, I just couldn't bring myself to do that. So, you know? and that's another thing I want to talk about. So, uh, last weekend, as of this recording, the first phase of Marvel Land was supposed to open up. Right. And, um, I, I lately I, I I went back and kind of thought about it. I've had this tradition where I've been to since Star Wars Land open to the public. I've been to every opening ceremony for something since uh, Star Wars Land first day open to the public after reservations were done. Uh, I went and uh, me and my buddy Robert we went. We were ready to face crowds. We were ready to do this. We got there. It was empty, <laughs> and I was like. Wow! Thank the fucking Lord, this is empty because I want to take some time to enjoy it. Wasn't that right when um, I think Disney had put a ton of blackout dates for a lot of their passes? And that's right? why it was empty. Right, right, right. So, uh, you know, me and Robert were expecting to go shoulder to shoulder with people to, you know, try to. We were gonna wait whatever it took just to get on the Millennium Falcon because we wanted to ride it, dude. Right. I think we waited like forty-five minutes to get on the Millennium Falcon, which is nothing. Man. Yeah. Opening day. Opening day to the public when they officially stopped reservations and to the public. That's amazing. Right. He like made sure that wasn't going to be crowded. Yeah. They they you know what though? I'll give it to them. Uh other than Rise of Resistance, which it still needs to have a little tweaks worked on to work on crowd wise, but Disney has done a good job with uh, their phased openings, I will say this. And a lot of people think that it was a a, a failure, but here's why it wasn't a failure. Um, I feel that with phased openings, it gives time to really soak in what they already have and prepare for what's to come. Now, with the first phase opening for Star Wars Land or uh, Batuu or uh, Black Spire Outpost, whatever you want to call it – you know, you had the Millennium Falcon ride, which was awesome. Still is awesome. I think it's such a revolutionary ride. It's the best thing since Star Tours, honestly, um, because Star Tours gave you that option of flying into a ship and having that motion simulator. The Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run took it to the next level where you actually get to pilot the ship and decide what this ship does, which something since I was a kid watching those movies, I've always wanted to do, and they really brought that to life, and I love Disney for that. So... With the first phase opening, they did a good job because they started off with previews for their employees like they always do. And then you got you had to get a reservation. Now, I think a reservation, and this is what a, pe- a lot of people don't realize, the reservations are what kept the crowds low. Because everyone was so, like, wanted to go and do it. And I remember even me trying to book a reservation and I couldn't get one. But... These reservations got the big crowds out of the way, so by the time the public opened, and and not to mention they helped with, with uh, blacking out the uh, the lower passes, anything below, um, I believe it was uh, deluxe could not get in, um, so that helped a lot too because it focused more on the higher up pass holder, pass holders and the paid guests who come from out of town who stay at the hotel and stuff. Right. So. All in all, I think it's still a success. Um, now, now it is a lot more packed. Um, and, of course, pe- more people are coming. What happened? Well, not right now. Well, not right now, obviously. But, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, when it when you, you know Disneyland was in operations, it, you know, it, it gets a lot of uh, foot traffic coming through because it's something new. When people, want, when people see something new, that's the first thing they want to go check out, you know. The rest of Disneyland's been there for – since 1955 – and, you know, it's like when something new opens, people, that's the first thing people are going to go to. Um, now, with Rise of the Resistance, I felt like they can work on that a little bit better. But I think they're doing a good job is with, with what they have, which is the boarding pass system. Um, and I can see that probably going to be included with the new Marvel Land as far as the, the Quinjet ride and the Spider-Man ride. Um, 
But I don't know. I think that the boarding pass system is very interesting. Sometimes it'll start at certain numbers and sometimes it will end at certain numbers. But uh, I, I can see why they did it because if they didn't have a boarding pass system, that ride would probably be all the way down to buy Haunted Mansion, the line. Um, there's no doubt about it. But yeah. I will say this, Disney. You guys have done an amazing job with Star Wars Land. You guys have brought out my inner childhood to a trilogy that I didn't even really enjoy. Um, however, I mean, I enjoyed some of it, but like I overall, it wasn't my favorite trilogy. But you based this land around a trilogy that I didn't, I didn't enjoy, and you still made me love it. With the Millennium right. Falcon and the Rise of the Resistance, which I didn't even care Rise of the Resistance took place during the new trilogy. The fact that they immerse you into this universe and really put you in this like experience that it feels like you're actually in space and it feels like you're actually fighting and stuff is beautiful you know, I've never seen the ride through of rise of the resistance um I've... you can watch i'll tell you this i'm trying to go in spoiler free, you're trying but... to go in spoiler free i know that but no matter what you watch on youtube it's not going to do justice until you ride it yourself i am so excited to finally get on that ride after like oh man um, I could not tell you how upset I was that I, or yeah, I, could, I can't even convey how upset I was that I wasn't going to be able to make it in like the first few weeks. And now the fact that it's been like months now, I still haven't done it. That's like, <laughs> like, so that, that's another fun story too. talk about my opening day obsession now that I've become an adult and I can, you know, do all this shit more free now. I don't have to have my mom drop me off or anything. Um, Rise of the Resistance is a, a day I will never forget. Um, so, Sammy, it was, I think, a Thursday night. A Thursday? No, it was a Wednesday night. I took Thursday off. Sammy, uh, I told Sammy, meet me at my house. Uh, bring some stuff. You'll spend the night, and we'll get up early, and we'll go. Sammy's like, all right. He calls me up around 10 o'clock. He's like, hey, bro, guess what? I called guest services uh the parking lot for toy story will be open all night we can actually go there and camp out and then come time morning we'll be like one of the first at the gate and i'm like all right cool mind you doesn't matter if you were first at the gate or not it all mattered if you got a boarding pass um so we get there we, you know we make a whole thing of it we go to circle k we buy a bunch of energy drinks we buy some waters to last us for the night we bring pillows we bring blankets i brought a bunch of comic books because i didn't know if i was going to sleep due to excitement and i was just going to either read all night so i didn't waste the battery on my phone um then we went down to Krispy Kreme down up the road and, and got a dozen donuts just to hold us off um we were ready for the night car ready and everything we were all pumped i was gonna throw on some star wars movies to get us even more pumped we, we get there, we go live on our Instagram, um, and the funny thing about that is we go live and all of a sudden, Josue joins. Josue and Tim, TLEV, if you guys don't know, are at the front gate, camping out. They're like, hey bro, we're at the front gate, come meet us here. And I'm like, wait, what? Security, Sammy called, said they wouldn't be letting anybody in past security at, until 6 a.m., no, we're here. Come jo come join us. And I go, well, there goes our sleep. <laughs> so we go is meet it, them. What happened? Is it worth it, though? <laughs> it was very much worth it. We go meet them. Uh, long story short, we meet them. We stay up all the way to like 10 o'clock in the morning, get our boarding pass. We're boarding pass like 70-something. Uh, mind you, boarding passes were going very slow that, that, that day. We, we planned on getting on the ride very early and then heading out. We didn't get on the ride till about 7 o'clock at night. Oh my god. <laughs> Holy shit. But I can promise you this. It was well worth it. Was it? It was. What were the crowds in the rest of the park that day? So, basically, everyone was there for Rise of the Resistance, obviously. <laughs> when the gates opened, um, the line was all the way to California Adventure. Just to get <laughs> into the park. So... It was insane. Main Street was packed. You can barely walk around Main Street regularly. Like, it was shoulder to shoulder. And talk about COVID-19. Like, that's scary. Um, and mind you, this ride opened in February. 
I think. Yeah. Uh, or was it November? Somewhere around there. Yeah, February, January. So COVID nineteen could have already happened. <laughs> um, or has it? Was it a year ago? I don't remember. I don't think so. Wait. No, I think Rise of Resistance opened this year, dude. It had to have. It has not been a year already since that ride's been open. Oh, I don't. There's no way. I think it was earlier this year. Come on, load. Um, December. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, it was this year because this is reading the um, Disney World December fifth. Yeah, uh, ours yeah. was like January something, right? January seventeenth, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, COVID could have been a thing. <laughs> That's probably we probably all had it at once. In the U.S., yeah. Yep. Um, uh, terrifying, but anyways. So, uh, yeah. Long story short, we got onto it uh, at seven o'clock at night. But I ended up after we got our boarding pass at ten. I ended up going back to the car and falling asleep till about three in the afternoon. So right, I took a nap. <laughs> yeah, solid, solid, solid power nap right there. Right. Um, but that's awesome. I'm so fucking jealous. That is like, uh, you describe that to me. That's like the perfect attraction right there. Just an all out balls to the walls, crazy budget Star Wars ride. Oh, dude. Is better than the fact that the experience starts while you're in line and then you do a little bit of the ride and then you get back in line and then just to go back on more of the ride. Like it is nuts. And don't they have the, like, because I've seen all of it up until you get into the ride vehicle itself. And just the theming of the queue. Like, I thought, I thought, like, Indiana Jones was, like, pinnacle. But holy my God. Yeah. Dude, this blows it out of the water. So you're walking through, of course, the um, the Resistance base. And you've seen all the gear and everything. Old gear all locked up and stuff. And then you walk and you get a transmission from um ray which looks dope it's an actual like hologram which looks amazing um <laughs> and then of course you you see bb8 and all that and then of course you go out you see poe's x-wing uh not poe poe yeah poe's x-wing his black x-wing and then you get onto that transport ship which takes you to the first part of the ride which i to this day still don't know how they accomplish that it is beautiful right uh but yeah that's just some of the most stunning theming I think has that's ever been made you know like right. the room and the wall disappears yeah, <laughs> yeah that. I don't know I think Disney's really killing it and I really hope that they can continue with maybe not the crazy budgets that they had for like Rise of the Resistance but I hope they can continue this like creative role they've kind of got going with star wars land and this is why marvel. i have such high hopes for marvel land because of rise of the resistance because of rise of the resistance i'm like you have to top it there with marvel land you have to i don't know if they'll top it but i understand what you're saying are you, you even know? you just have to be on that level like you can't go anything below that after that attraction came out right that just set a whole new standard for what well Indian okay movie. let me rephrase that because there's two different ways you can look at rides at Disney. If you're making big blockbuster rides that you know are going to make you money, i.e. Marvel Land, then it has to match Rise of Resistance. But if you're going to make a simple dark ride that you know will just kind of be a retheming of a ride, it doesn't have to match Rise of Resistance because that's just a simple retheme that they want to do and, or change something real quick. So it doesn't have to necessarily match that. It just has to be a good enough quality ride for people to enjoy. What I think is important to note, though, is that I think that there's a standard of creativity. Not so much how they can flex their budget, like with Rise of the Resistance, you know, and hopefully Marvel Land. Um, but uh, something that seems to have been kind of lacking, uh, Disney attractions, you know, we had that kind of, in my opinion, half-assed Pixar Pier. Like, it, you know, I'm not going to say half-assed, but... It wasn't to a quality standard that I think Disney uh, means. You know, Disney like parks carry this badge of you know creativity and quality that I don't think it like really reached. Well, but I 
really promising uh and i hope it extends to all of their rides that they create uh going forward maybe not in like crazy spectacle but in every like minute detail they get the most out of it you know because you're not obviously not gonna have a park full of rise the resistances you know yeah that's just visible i I think and it's funny you bring up pixar pier because i think that that was a very rushed project I, i think they saw that for starters the attraction that really kicked it all off was the incredicoaster their focus was to get that ride done before incredibles 2 came out so they can have something that can open with Incredibles 2. Mind you, I did like California Screaming, but that was an amazing retheme of that ride, in my opinion. I think it was a really good retheme. I think they did what they could with what they had. I just don't think... Um, I mean, like, to me, I kind of prefer California Screaming. And, like, I think it falls more in line with the theme and it executes the theme as best as it can in all areas whereas i think there was definitely some areas in particular the screen tunnels right uh you know the black kind of just pitch black tunnels where it's like it feels a little void of um life sometimes and then like you know you had jack jack on a stick and all that kind of stuff you know i just think that um that uh you know it wasn't horrible i'm not saying that at all you know it could have you know it could have been a lot worse i think um but it just doesn't stack up to um the uh brain power that goes behind like a lot of disneyland projects right now have you been on that ride in the dark uh i think i have once or twice it's even better at night cool because the black tunnels aren't as jarring you know um but it's definitely cool but i just don't i think it's a matter of um if that ride was at disneyland i don't think they would have executed it how they executed it in um california adventure yeah um yeah i think because it it was just an issue of them trying to retheme paradise or paradise pier into pixar pier super fast um Six months, right? Yeah. I, I went to the opening of that, too, by the way, on accident. Really? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wanted to go to Disneyland, and ironically, it was the same day that that ride opened, and yeah. it was insanely packed. The line was all the way out to the pier um, coming up, and uh, we got on. We got a fast pass, and we got on it. Um, so I went to that ride. That was actually what started my whole opening day tradition for attractions um, <laughs> as far as Disneyland goes. Um, but... No, I mean, I, I think because they rethemed the carousel to Jesse's carousel. They gave an, another Toy Story ride, which did not open till like, late last year. Like, I think, like, September, I think, or August. Or open? What happened? Inside, Inside Out? Inside Out? Yeah. Inside Out opened, and that was the last attraction to open, but that took a long time as well. Right. That took super long. Which... I remember the coaster and just being like, almost done down there. Yeah. <laughs> which... Should have not taken nearly as long as it as it really. I mean, unless they were waiting on the things to get repainted, because they literally took that from Bugs Land and just put it over there. You kind of dropped it in a new spot. Yeah, they just what? throw a coat of paint on it, and it was good. Right, it was resourceful of them. Yeah. I'm just I feel like there's a lot of those spinner attractions in um, California Adventure for some reason, and it's just like it's it's definitely a weird like tonal shift from. Um, disneyland for sure you know right they were just like uh we got some space to fill on a, you know throw a spinner ride in there you know right. <laughs> there's what because there's the carousel there's the inside out spinner there's um well i guess there used to be the ladybug thing um why am i thinking there's more are there more uh you have the carousel you have the the swing one. Oh, the swing right Thank then you. the zipper, like the yeah, the Zephyr. So there's like four of them in just that little area. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, I have a lot of faith in Marvel Land, and here's why. Disney was very smart early on when they when they acquired the purchase of Star Wars and Marvel. They knew from the get-go that was going to make them a fuck ton of money, whether the movie sucked or not, because fans are going to go see them. 
Marvel, for me, has not made one disappointing movie, in my opinion. And that's because I'm just a comic book fan, and I just love seeing these heroes come to life on the screen. Star Wars, however, has made three not-so-good movies, but has still made a ton of money off of them. Mm-hmm. Now, Disney Plus was further launching their their success. It outbeat like every streaming service when it first launched. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's why I think Marvel Land will be a success. Guardians of the Galaxy opened up a couple years ago. And I went to opening week of that. Not opening day, but I went to opening week. I waited three hours to get on that ride. Well worth the wait for me. Incredible, incredible ride. So what makes this ride so unique and good, for starters, one, James Gunn and the entire cast were involved, which was awesome. James Gunn directed every scene that you see in that ride. Oh, shit. Okay. So... While they were filming Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Disney came with the idea, proposal of, hey, listen, we're building this new ride. It's going to be based around the Guardians of the Galaxy. We want them to play themselves in the ride. Uh, and then we figured, since while you're shooting this, if you can just shoot the extra things for this. It only took them a week to shoot because it was a small thing. Just had to shoot their scenes and, and different scenes for the ride, um, which majority of the time was all in front of a green screen. Yeah. So... Yeah, James Gunn was approached to do this project. He he helped out. He did it, and that's the final product that we got. What makes this ride also so unique is that you get a very small glimpse of the big collection of The Collector. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with The Collector, uh, Tanner Tavon, played by uh, the amazingly talented Benicio Del Toro, um, The Collector is known for collecting a lot of rare items in the galaxy, uh, whether they'd be from Earth any planet he can find the rarest items, he, he collects it, puts it part of his collection. Um, and what's unique about this is the fact that Disney and Marvel look at this as, okay, from what they, this is what they said too, that, you know, every now and then we can throw in a new item from a new movie or something like that in that collection at Disneyland and the fans will go apeshit. The last time they actually did that was when they added the birds um, that you see in there from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Um, so I'm hoping they start adding more stuff, but I mean, they have, they have an Ultron bot in there, which is dope. They got a lot of Thor, the dark, uh, the dark world stuff in there, which is cool. Um, some you know, name, what happened? Uh, you know, Figment from, uh, uh, from Magic Kingdom or no Epcot. Sorry. Right. Yeah. They got some, they even have Disney Easter eggs. They have, um, the Yeti from the old Matterhorn stocked in the, in the basement or the boiler room. Um, so many Easter eggs. If you just really pay attention, there's so much, and I love that. So that's another reason why I love this ride. And the third and final reason is, yeah, I I mean, don't get me wrong. Tower of Terror is probably hands down one of my all-time favorite rides as well. The whole 30s theming of you being put in a Twilight Zone episode. Twilight Zone is one of the greatest science fiction shows ever made, hands down. I'm gonna stand by that argument. I think a lot of people would agree with me too. But I think. It comes to a certain time where, of course, as much as a fan base as that show has, and of course with the revival with Jordan Peele and everything, it comes a time where you got to eventually, coming back to what we're talking about, retheme things. Right. For better or for worse, it, it just comes a time where you got to keep going with what's going on today in modern society. MCU right now is one of those biggest things that's going on in the world. Everyone knows these characters, whether you've seen the movies or not. And everyone has at least probably seen one Marvel movie. If not, they they know the characters at the very least, or the actors portraying the characters. Um, so they've established something amazing with this. And Guardians of the Galaxy was the test to see how this would work and if this, and if this would work. And it worked. It really worked because this was the first Marvel attraction at any Disney park ever. Right. Um. Japan yeah. Japan went on to do a Ant-Man ride, which I heard is really cool, and it has Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly in it, which is dope. Um, and I think that's it right now for, for Marvel rides. I think they're working on more. Guardians of the Galaxy in Florida open. I don't... Yeah. Are they re-theming their Tower of Terror? Because I don't think they're re-theming, they're re-theming it. Uh, it's like a coaster. Oh, okay. They're, so they're building a, they're retheming an old ride then. 
Uh, no, it's a brand new one. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Uh, world. I didn't know. I didn't know about that, honestly. I think they announced it, what, like... D23? Two years ago or something like that. Yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. Oh! So they're re-theming... They're re-theming the Aerosmith ride. No. I don't think so. I no, think they are. Rock and Roller Coaster is in Hollywood Studios. This is in Epcot. Oh, okay. This is a brand new ride. There's, it's not a re-theme. It's, uh, what did they... Yeah. Yeah, and it looks, from what I've seen, it looks... Uh, let's see, how much have they... Well... Yeah, I mean, there's stuff, as far as I'm aware. I had heard that they were going to be re-theming the Aerosmith coaster, too. Are they? Well, I don't know about it's that. It's something else. I don't remember what it was. a big property. I know that, but... Reversed in... Um... I try, but <laughs> but um, I think Marvel Land will be a success overall. Spider Man is a huge property, and that's getting its own ride. Everyone's a fan with this new Tom Holland uh, Spider Man, including me. So I'm really looking forward to that. He's a very popular character. I think he's one of the top three well known superheroes of all time, because um, I think it's Superman, Batman, and then Spider Man. Honestly, so he's one of the top three well known superheroes of all time. If you you don't know exactly who is it you have at least seen him once in your life like that's that's a given right and i think with the quinjet avengers ride it would be cool the one thing they're gonna fuck up though if they don't put this in the land in my opinion two things actually they need to have one somewhat of a tribute to stanley mm-hmm. oh yeah if it's a must do it yeah <laughs> Whether it be a statue, I mean, you can go straight the Walt Disney route where you give them your own statue in that land, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. with the quote Excelsior on it, um, or two, and this would be a major fuck up if they didn't do this, but put a comic book store in there. Yeah, or at least some form of one, you know. Yeah. Like, you gotta have something. I know for sure there's gonna be a falafel stand there, or not falafel, um, shawarma. Right, yeah. So that's going to be cool. And they're going to have themed churros with the colors of the Infinity Stones. Oh, is that right? Yeah. When did they announce this? They announced this at D23. Gotcha. Okay. So cool. that's going to be cool. I'm excited for that. But uh, th- that's going to probably do it for the topic of Disney. I mean, that. with that all being said, I mean, I think Disney's just done a fantastic job, and they're going to continue to do a fantastic job. So we'll, we should see. I mean, hopefully the parks will open soon, but I'd rather COVID-19 go away a little bit, maybe get our numbers down before we reopen anything. Before we jump into opening everything up. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the rumors going around with uh, Halloween Horror Nights. All right, yeah. Now, before we get any further, take this with a very tiny grain of salt. These are just rumors. Uh, where these are not been confirmed at all. We are just passing down the news that we hear. So if they do end up true, uh, potential spoilers, I guess. But there's not really anything getting spoiled um, because, I mean, we've already talked about speculations and that looks like that was a leaked lineup as well. So we've already talked about that many times on the channel. But this one is pretty interesting because I want to get your thoughts on that. I want to I want to see what you have to say about this. But what do you think of the of the idea of potentially having an HHN during the day? Right, having all the mazes open with the daytime attractions for regular guests. Yeah, I mean, minus the two metro sets, because it looks like they're tearing those down, but the Mummy Q, Downstage 29, Walking Dead attraction, and Waterworld. What, what do you, how do you feel about that? Um, I mean, it's difficult because I don't know if by October we're even going to be in a space where I think it's going to be safe to open the parks in general let alone Horror Nights and adding new attractions, especially with, you know, have, it's so important to mazes to have those, like, uh, like opening, like barriers, you know, they have to push open. I just, I don't think it's the right time. I think we got to skip this year as much as it hurts to say that. Yeah. I don't know if it's the right move on Universal's part. But what do you think, like, let's, let's, let's like forget, let, 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 let's, let's, let's think, like COVID nineteen is under control, it's safe to do so. Like, what is your just thoughts about having a daytime HHN though? 
That that is definitely going to be interesting because didn't they do something in Orlando where for Stranger Things Day they had the maze open for like one day to the regular public after the? I event. thought they did that here in Hollywood. Did they? I think was it was that- a daytime walk through the maze without actors. You can just look through the sets and take pictures. Okay, so I think um, it's going to be doable, but I think it's going to be neat. It's going to need to be toned down a crazy amount in order to be palatable for like the average guest. Cause what you got to understand is when you're buying a, like a special ticket to the event, you're acknowledging this is the Halloween event. There's warnings everywhere. Not recommended for people under 13, you know, you know, stay away if you're going to be too squeamish, but with the regular, you know, the, that's not the, uh, there's no warning signs like that over the entire park. And so when you're adding in these way more intense than would be normally present attractions, I don't think it would go over well for them to uh, not tone it down, you know? Because right. I think you're just lining yourself up for more controversies. Like uh, ooh, a few years ago, wasn't it like the Purge announcer got in trouble? With, We're saying um, some stuff, yeah, to a girl. But I, the way I look at it, there won't be scare zones, obviously, because they won't do that. But... Here's my issue with it, and, and if you guys don't know what we're talking about by now, uh, there's been rumors saying that they're going to take what attractions they have built already and include them into the daytime operations of Universal Studios Hollywood. That way you kind of still get your HHN, but during the day. Now, here's my issue with that. An event like Halloween Horror Nights is meant to be experienced at night. No questions, no, no questions about it. It really is. It's called Halloween Horror Nights for a reason because it's a Halloween-themed event for children or for people over the age of 13 and and older. It's an event that scares you, and it's an event that in the title says night. It takes place at night, obviously. So if you guys been through the event either here in, in the West Coast or on the East Coast, you know that... If you have a, a maze in the outside, um, lighting and, and the maze in general is just not good during the day. Right. Because if you have like early entry and then sometimes even right as the park opens, there's still going to be the sun out and whatnot. And it really can mess up a lot of the uh, visual effects and can reveal a lot of scares and whatnot. Right. Is it like noon or 1 p.m. is going to be even more drastic. So in order to get around that, what they would have to do is put wooden boards and basically make a roof over that if they really want to get those effects right. Yeah. Which is extra money and extra work. Now, I don't like the idea because, number one, like I said, these mazes are meant for night and – a perfect example of this was Ghostbusters. Now, Ghostbusters had this effect, of course, of the uh, – they had a black light effect, and it looked like these people were floating. They were wearing certain things up to a certain point in their body, so it made them look like they're floating once they moved away from said body. And they had, like, black on the bottom, which made them look awesome and floating. But if you noticed every time you went through that maze during early entry, those performers were never there until nightfall. They just didn't work. No. You see everything. Yeah. Um, so I think it's going to be, I mean, they're going to have to be really particular with how they execute a lot of uh, effects in the maze. Also, what you were saying about the wood boards and whatnot, I don't know if that could be pulled off because I think that introduces new concerns about like ventilation in the mazes. Because if you think about it, you're in a black box in a black tent and it's open so that, you know, air can flow through the top. But if you seal that off, all of a sudden you're stuck in like a still air and everything. And it already gets hot from body heat in there. Right. I, and also at, you know, in uh, September and October in the LA and Orlando, well, no, uh, LA sun, I just don't see that going over well. You Ending know? the summer, beginning of fall, still very hot. Super hot. Especially because heat tends to spike a little bit in October, get back to the 90s and whatnot, normally like late October. So there's a lot of problems that come with that. So that begs the question, the only two mazes that would work in this scenario would be Soundstage 29 and Walking Dead. 
Yeah, you're right. Because they're both inside. Yeah, uh, I think Orlando, like if I don't even think they're going this route, but if they were going to go this route, they'd be a lot better equipped because they have multiple soundstage mazes. As I yeah, t- and um, we kind of we kind of got like two, kind of one, you know, if yeah. you want to keep walking dead as a soundstage maze. Yeah. It was in a tricky spot there, you know? Yeah. So I, I don't know. I, uh, as much as it pains me to say this, I hope they don't do that. Um, as much as I love the event, I, I don't want it ruined for me as far as like, I don't want to walk out of this maze Maybe it would have been like a fucking amazing maze, and then I walk out because of the sunlight, and it ruined it for me. Yeah, exactly. It's like these events are made for special effects and everything that should be done at night. That's why Killer Clowns looks so beautiful because it was at night. You know, that's why Ghostbusters looks so beautiful because it was at night. You know, all these big time like special effects heavy, you know, mazes look really good at night, especially. With the majority of our event taking place outdoors, other than Walking Dead and Soundstage 29, even like the tents won't do that much covering of sunlight. They only do so much. Um, I think it's also important to note the properties we're getting, you know, with like Beetlejuice and then even like Haunting of Hill House and stuff like that. Those especially are going to require that. A lot mm-hmm. of special heavy effects. I mean, Haunting of Hill House is rumored to be in Soundstage 29, so uh, let's hope for that. But yeah, I mean, Beetlejuice was rumored to be in the Metro sets, and it looks like that's one of the mazes they're taking down. Um, so we'll see. Uh, but I don't know, man. I just think that for, for the best and for the safety of everyone, actors and guests, just don't do the event this year. Yeah. I mean, sure. it's going to be, be kind of sucky to know that whatever Orlando does, IP-wise, we're going to look at that and go, fuck, that's what we were going to get this year? Really? Fuck. Like, we're going to we're gonna be legit pissed. I can promise all the HHN fans that. Whatever Orlando gets this year, IP-wise, and if we don't have an event this year, we're going to be pissed. Now, there's also been rumors saying that as of this recording, this Thursday or Friday, they're going to announce that they're canceling the event. I don't know if that happened or not. We are recording this, like, on a Wednesday. So... Stuff could have happened from now until when we recorded, um, but I don't know. I mean, I just feel that I will be very mad to know that Orlando got the IPs that we were going to get, and especially if it's like Beetlejuice and, and uh, Haunting the Hill House and all that. Like, I'll be kind of upset, but it gives me hope for 2021, hopefully that we get a better event, although we know Murdy will be losing a ton of money if the event doesn't go on this year. Right. Um, I do think, though, um, that uh, these properties like Beetlejuice and Billie Eilish and Haunting Hill House are kind of destined to be massive hits at the event. And I think there is a possibility that we see kind of um, kind of a trick-or-treat killer clowns uh, type where Orlando's going to get it in some shape or form. And then the following year, it'll come to both parks or just Hollywood um, because properties like that, like Beetlejuice, really is what I'm thinking, are huge and have been, uh, you know, and are definitely going to be money makers for you. And I think if Warner Brothers doesn't have their haunt event in the next few years, I think it's definitely going to be in their best interest to get those properties and give them another go. Because... Right easy money right there right so yeah i mean we'll see what happens with universal um we'll keep you guys updated on that but will we have come to the end of the first episode of shoot the shit man all right i'm pretty i'm pretty sure we shot the shit a lot today there was a lot of shit shot (laughs) (laughs) that's a that's a t-shirt coming soon right there there was a lot of shit shot um thank you guys everyone so much for watching the relaunch episode of shoot the shit it's been some time since we've done this but we're, we're, we're glad to be back um and i'm glad uh we're hoping that you guys enjoyed it next week we'll have uh either logan or sammy both on or all, all of us hopefully will be on and it will probably be a, a more uh talk heavy conversation i mean but i think i think you and i will we, we covered a lot today um covered theme park openings we covered uh reunions and and the future of hhn so 
this is just a tiny glimpse of what Shoot the Shit could be. Honestly, if there's any news as far as movies or anything that comes out, I mean, we'll talk about it. But this is just what was on our mind today. There's no really scripts to this. It's just whatever's on the top of our head, and we'll just start talking about. So that's the fun part about this show. Um, but if you guys enjoyed Shoot the Shit, please hit that subscribe button and that bell notification be aware every time we put up a new video, as well as that like button and leave some comments below what you guys thought about the show. Um, also, check us out. Uh, if you guys are listening on like Spotify or anything right now, uh, thank you guys for listening. Make sure to hit that follow button and on our podcast to be aware every time we put up a new podcast on either YouTube or any of the streaming uh, podcast services you are listening on right now. Um, also, check out our merch t-shirt. Our merch t-shirt. I can never get that right. Check out our merch shop. Links in the description below. And if you guys are on any podcasting streaming services, check out our social media where you'll find the link in our description or our bio, and that will take you to our merch shop. Or just go on our Twitter, and it will be right there on our on our Twitter page. It's pinned right there. So we got some Shoot the Ship merch that is out right now. Check that out, as well as other merchandise for East vs. West, Mindless Horror Podcast, and, of course, the Knights of Horror merch. I am your host, Anthony. That's your host, Will, right there. <laughs> and we'll be in the